call it the file called lock and link. And I'm going to show you a bunch of ways of protecting layers. It's going to seem kind of frivolous, what we're doing here, but think about other ways these techniques could be used. For this, I'll just say, imagine you're working at a studio, you know, you're an assistant and there's another assistant who keeps going in and messing up your files, you know, uh, drawing on them and moving layers around. Let's take a look at how we can stop these layers from getting painted on, moved, and then you can imagine how it could be used in other situations. Uh, the first thing this other assistant keeps doing is he comes in and he moves this blue dot around. Or it could be you're doing some compositing and you've added some elements to something and you accidentally move something out of position. Maybe you're doing some work up here, you got the move tool selected and you accidentally click and drag and something moves off the screen and you didn't notice it, but things are messed up down in that corner there. You can lock those layers. And you'll notice in the layers panel, right above the different layers here, these are all the different locks that you can put onto the layers. This one here just locks everything. It means you can't paint on the layer, you can't move the layer, you can't throw it out. There's all kinds of things you can't do. But let's say we want this blue circle not to be able to move anywhere. First off, select the layer that we want to do something to. So I'm going to highlight this blue layer. And if you're not sure which layer it is, if you're looking through going, which one is it? Is it this one here? If you turn the eyeballs off and on, that'll give you an idea of which layer you're looking at. So, we, oh, there we go. That's the blue layer there. So when you click on it, it's highlighted in gray. And in order to lock its position, you'll notice this little icon here looks an awful lot like the icon for the move tool. And if we click it, you'll see a little generic lock icon appears over here. This icon doesn't tell you what's locked. It just tells you that something is locked. And when you look up here, this is darkened. So if I tried to move that, if I grab my move tool and I try to move that blue layer, it says, whoop, can't use the move tool because the layer is locked. Now the move tool has other ways of operating. Uh, by default, you need to select a layer that you want to move. If I wanted to move this red layer here, I would select it and then I can move this red circle around. It doesn't matter where I click, it's this red circle that I'm going to move. If I want to move the purple circle, click on that purple circle layer and I can move the purple circle. If you're moving a lot of elements around, let's say you're doing a promotional piece and you got a bunch of images that you're going to put in your, put your logo over here and some text over here and some photos and you're going to be selecting things all over the place. Instead of having to come over here and click on the layer that you want to move, at the top here, auto select. And watch this. When this is turned on, I click on this purple circle, I can move the purple circle around. I click on the red circle, I can move the red circle around. Now, here's something interesting. If I click on the blue circle, the background moves. And the reason for that is because we had the auto select turned on, when I clicked on the blue circle, it knew that it was locked, so it selected the next thing down in the stack which was this background layer. So be careful of that. But the nice thing is if I'm doing some work somewhere else and I accidentally have this blue layer selected, maybe I've been doing some painting on it or something, and then I go up here and I use the move tool, I'm like, oops, won't let me move it out of the way. And you might find, you know, you've composited something in, you know, you cut something out and you put it over top of something else and it was just nicely hiding things. And then you, oops, accidentally move it to the side and things are no longer in alignment. So locking the position means that you can't accidentally drag it out of position. Now, I did say, you know, this is stop that other assistant from moving things around for you. This isn't a permanent thing. If the other assistant really wanted to move that, he could simply unlock it and move it around. So it's just a way of kind of protecting yourself from, well, from yourself. What else could we do? This guy's noggin. Take a look at that layer down there. What, what sort of background? It's, it's a black logo. And what sort of background is, the, is on the layer for that black logo? Is it a transparent background? It looks pretty transparent, doesn't it? Here's its layer up here. And look at this. It's in a blending mode. Multiply. Set that back to normal for a second. Oh. It's actually got a white background. Let's say you've got your logo, you designed it, uh, you know, uh, and you put it on a white document. You're like, oh man, now I've got to cut this out and paste it, and, I, and it brings a bit of white fringe with it. Blending modes can be a real fast way of, uh, well, blending things together. Uh, there's a bunch of other things we're going to take a look at for using blending modes, but in this case, the rule for multiply is the density of the layer, in this case the black part of the logo, gets added on to the density of the layers below. So if I pop this into multiply, all the black shows up as it was. If there had been any shades of gray on there, the shades of gray would show up. But anything white simply disappears. Some cartoonists will use this technique. They'll uh, you know, they, they draw their cartoon on some paper, maybe you know, it's a little charcoal, get some shades of gray in there, scan it on a flatbed scanner. In Photoshop, you're like, OK, how am I going to color this in without just painting over top of the lines? Well, if you put that line art layer 
on top, put it into multiply blending mode, you can do your painting underneath it and you'll see that line art right over top. The white paper, you know, the, you, you scan, you try to get rid of the white background, but there's some gray areas behind the, you know, the charcoal -y bits. That simply disappears. There's none of that white fringing that appears. So blending modes can be a great way to really quickly blend things together. And in this case, it looks as though this guy's been perfectly cut out onto transparent, when in fact he's actually sitting on his original white background. Now when we're moving him around, so I, you know, I move the noggin around. Uh, if I wanted to move this green circle, I could also click on the green circle and move it around. But what if I wanted them to move together at the same time? There's a couple ways we could do it. You can select multiple layers if you hold down the shift key. So if I clicked on the face layer up here, and then I held down the shift key and clicked on the green layer, oh, except it selects all the layers in between. What if I only wanted to select the face layer and the green layer, but nothing in between? Anybody know? Command will let you sec select things that aren't connected. All right, so once we have them both selected, we can move them together. Now here's something cool, stacking order. The green circle is below the red and the blue circle. The black face is above the red and the blue circle. Watch this. Eh, eh, pretty cool, eh? Yeah. Now if I deselect, okay, they're no longer selected at the same time. What if I always want them to move together? We can link those layers. Again, let's select both those layers. So I'll select the face up above, hold down the command key, click on that bottom layer. And if you right click, link layers. And look at what happens. These little chain link icons appear at the side. So now if I grab my move tool, it doesn't matter if I had them selected or not. If I just click on the face layer and start moving it around, the bottom layer moves at the same time because they're linked together. You only see those chain link icons when you have them highlighted. So you highlight either of them we can tell that these two layers are linked. And if you want to unlink them, simply right click and you can unlink those layers. So that can be handy. You know, maybe you have a, uh, a separate group of elements that you've become been compositing together in one corner there and they're positioned perfectly with, with each other. You don't want to accidentally move one out of position and oh, I have to figure out where exactly it came from. If you link all those layers together, simply clicking on any of them will let you move them all together. So it can be an important way of making sure your compositions don't get knocked out of alignment. All right, what else can we do? Ooh, locking pixels. Um, this purple layer up here. Again, that nasty assistant keeps coming in with a paintbrush and he keeps painting on your purple layer. You're like, why does he keep doing that? Here is what we can do. We can stop him from painting on the layer. So select the purple layer there. Make sure you got the right layer. Just turn the eyeball off and on. All right, select that purple layer and click that paintbrush icon and you've locked those pixels. So now try painting on it. Oh, can't use the brush tool because the layer is locked. So those pixels can't be changed. So again, you're doing a composition, you've composited something in, you put it over here, and you, you don't want to accidentally draw on that while you're drawing on other things. You can lock the pixels in that layer, and those pixels can't be changed. Now, stacking order. We talked about how you know the green circle and the face are on different layers. Uh, we can change stacking order. See how this purple layer right now is below? It's at the very bottom of the stack. If you grab it, you'll get that little grabby hand icon. And notice that when you hover in between layers, see that bright line that appears? If we let go, it actually ends up in that new position. And if you've got to get it right to the very top of the stack, it can be a little bit tough. But when you get towards the top there, you'll see that bright line appear. And again, when you let go, so you can change the stacking order of those layers. So if you're trying to composite things together and something keeps slipping in behind something else, think of the stacking order. We're looking down through this stack of layers here. So whatever you see first will always appear in front of things. So now this purple layer is in front of everything else, whereas before it had been behind everything else. So stacking order can be quite important when you're compositing things together. Now the client, in this case, has called up and said that purple circle, they want that to be yellow. So we're gonna change this color, but we're gonna do it non-destructively. What does non-destructive mean again? It means we don't actually change any pixels in the image. So these pixels right now are purple. What do you think we could use to make these pixels turn a different color? Let's throw on a hue and saturation adjustment layers. There's a couple places you can get adjustment layers from. At the very top, you'll see icons for all of the adjustment layers. And if you hover over top of the icons, it'll give you the name of the adjustment layers. I usually go down to the very bottom of the layers panel and you'll see this little half white, half gray circle appear. And this gives you the name, so you don't have to try to figure out what the icons are. Plus, I mean, I, I'm really old and I was doing Photoshop since before that adjustment panels existed. So this is where I get mine from. And I'm going to throw in a hue and saturation. And let's talk a little bit about how this tool works. First off, what is hue? Hue is like a color. Yeah, so red, green, blue, those are all hues. All right. What's saturation? Saturation is 
how pure or how close to pure that color is. So the hue slider, you'll notice it has this big spectrum right across it. But at the bottom, look at this, there's two of those spectra across the bottom there. Look what happens when you move that hue slider. Watch those two spectra as they kind of slide relative to each other. So if I made this yellow, if I pull this to the right there, that purple circle is now yellow. But if we look in the layer stack, it's not actually yellow. The nice thing about this is if the client comes back and says, oh, now instead of yellow, we want it to be green. I can just say, oh, no problem. Double click on this, grab that slider, and I can shift that around to make it whatever color I want. The saturation, watch this. If I start pulling the saturation down, you'll see the colors get a little bit more muted. And if we take it all the way to the bottom, what do you think will happen to those colors? Gray. Yeah, they'll go totally gray. So you can see the brightness of those colors is the same as the rest of the gray background. It's that saturation that gives them their color. It gives them that that contrast against the background. Okay, the way these sliders are working, remember you see these two sliders sliding relative to each other? That circle that used to be purple is now yellow. And look at this, purple is now yellow. The circle over here that used to be red, red is now green. This original one that used to be blue, blue is now red. So this is telling you what the color used to be and this is telling you what the color has become. Now, the downside of this, of course, is the client said they wanted the purple circle to be yellow, but if I turn this eyeball off and on, it's affecting everything, isn't it? How can I make this adjustment layer affect only that purple circle? Clipping. clipping mask. And there's a bunch of ways we can get to clipping masks. This little, these four lines up here, this is called a hamburger button. If we click on that, we've got create clipping mask. The keyboard shortcut is option command G. We could choose that. Remember that little line in between each of these layers? If we hold down the Option key, you'll see this icon appears. And if you click between the two layers that you want to clip, you can release or create a clipping mask. And if it's an adjustment layer, you'll notice at the bottom of the Properties panel, there's this little icon that looks an awful lot like the icon you get when you hover over this line with the Option key pressed. That will also release or create clipping masks. And the nice thing about the clipping mask is it means that this layer, in this case the adjustment layer, you notice it's jumped to the right a few pixels and this little arrow has appeared pointing directly at this layer. It's only affecting that layer. If I turn this eyeball off and on now, the only thing it's changing is that purple circle. So that has become a yellow circle. All right, so nice non-destructive way of changing the colors of things, limiting its effect to only the layer directly below. Transparency, what is transparency? Yeah, so right now you can see there's this checkerboard pattern in here, so we know that those areas are transparent. Now the client wants us to take this red circle here, and you know these are all like flat looking circles, almost like pieces of paper kind of cut out and stuck down, but this one, they want us to turn it into a three-dimensional sphere. Can we do that? Yes, we can. If this was a, a ball, like a red ball kind of floating there, and there was a light shining down on it from this side, what would you expect to see to make this look three-dimensional? It would be a shadow on this side over here, not just behind it falling onto the background, but the, the ball itself would be kind of shaded on that side there. Now I'm gonna grab a paintbrush, I'll just hit B on the keyboard, and I'm gonna make sure I got pure black and pure white as my foreground and background. What's the keyboard shortcut to get my default? D for the default colors, excellent. And if I need to reverse them, I can just hit this little thing here. Or what's the keyboard shortcut to reverse them? X, X which is excellent, good for you guys. So I'm gonna take a paintbrush, hit B on the keyboard, and I can change the size of my brush using the square brackets to the right of the P key. And if I right click, I can change the softness of the brush. Now a hard edge brush would probably give me a fairly hard edged shadow there. But if I choose a soft brush, watch this. And I'll drill a bit of a lower opacity too, maybe 50%. I can paint a shadow onto this ball. Now the thing is, uh, it's appearing not only on the red sphere, but also around the background. Ooh, we can protect that with a lock. Let me undo that, Command Z. And this little one here that looks like a Minecraft creeper face, it also shows the checkerboard of the transparent pixels. If I click on it, I have locked the transparent pixels on that layer. If I try painting over here, nothing is gonna happen. The only place I can paint is where there's pixels on that layer, which means if I wanna give this that little shadow, and here's the reason for having such a soft brush. When you're working with a soft brush, it's full intensity in the center and it fades out to nothing just outside that ring there, which means if I only use half of the brush, I have a gradient from full intensity out to nothing. And the shadow on this would kind of fall towards this side here, light coming from this direction, so the shadow would go around here. 
And because I've locked the transparency, I can start painting out here. I've clicked, nothing's happening. But watch what happens as I use that soft feathered edge of the brush to just gently bring in that shadow in there. Starting to get that three-dimensional sort of look to it. And don't be afraid to undo. Command Z if you mess it up. And I'm using that fairly low opacity so you can kind of do multiple swipes if I need to. So you can get that three-dimensional look to that sphere in there. Yeah, so to, if you want to throw a highlight on the other side, again, you can just hit X on the keyboard, get you some white paint. And here's where you get to have a little bit of fun. You get to decide if this is a glossy sphere or if it's a matte sort of sphere. If I did a highlight like this, is that a glossy or a matte surface? Well, what about this? That's a little glossier, isn't it? This kind of looks like a point light source falling onto it. Now, the, the fact that this shadow edge is a little bit softer would make me think that maybe it is a bit of a larger light source, in which case I'll just take a larger brush and with a bit of a lower opacity, maybe 60% or so, you throw a little shadow on like that. It looks like a little bit of a, a duller sort of surface. So play around with it. Have a little bit of fun with it. See if you can make a glossy, reflective looking surface on it. Now, how could we give that ball a shadow? Just a simple layer style. They're called layer styles, but at the bottom of the layers panel, they go with FX, like special effects, FX. But uh, they're called layer styles. I guess they did FX because it, I don't know, looks better than LS. If you click on that little pop-up there, you got a whole bunch of options in here. Let's just throw on a simple drop shadow. And the dialogue for the drop shadow, in the center part here, you see you've got the angle, you've got the distance. If you increase the distance, the shadow looks farther away. Decrease it, it's almost like it's right underneath. Based on the direction of the light that's falling on this, where should that shadow go, do you think? Yeah, probably down around this direction. So the light's shining in through here, and the shadow should go this direction. Now, instead of playing with the angle and the distance, watch this. You can also simply click right in the image and drag that shadow around. So I'll just pull her down. And the hardness of the shadow, if it had been a hard light on this, let's say there'd been like a hard edge shadow on there, we could de decrease the size. And you see this simulates almost like a point light source, like the sun shining down on a very hard cast shadow. As we increase the size, it simulates a softer light source, maybe a little soft box or a beauty dish or something. And when it looks good, you can just hit OK. And if you want to make adjustments to it, let's say you think, oh man, I wish you know, I'd made it a little bit of a harder edge. You'll notice underneath the layer, we have two little things that have appeared here. One just says effects, and it has a, an eyeball beside it. And right below it is the drop shadow. You can have multiple layer styles. Uh, in this case, we don't need them. But let's say we did. Let's say I threw on, uh, let's do a bevelin emboss. What the heck? It's not going to look very good. There you go. Hit OK. You can see we have multiple layer styles here. And if we only wanted to show one, let's say I wanted to turn off the drop shadow, I can turn off its eyeball. Or if I want to show it without the bevel and emboss, I can turn off its eyeball. Or if I just want to see it without any effects, I can turn off this eyeball, and all of the effects are turned off. And let's say we wanted to use that drop shadow on, let's say we wanted to give it to the uh, yellow one as well. I'm not going to make it into a 3D sphere, but you know, if it's a piece of paper that's floating up there, it too would be casting a similar sort of shadow. We don't have to select it and go to effects and give it a drop shadow and match the angle and all that kind of stuff. Watch this. If we right click on this layer style, we can choose copy layer style. We can pop up to the, uh, I don't know if I should call this the yellow layer or the purple layer, but if we right click on its name, we can choose paste layer style. And all of those layer styles get transferred over to it. So this can come in handy if you're doing like, um, a promo piece where you've got like, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheet or maybe, you know, five by seven postcard size that you're going to send out. And you have a whole bunch of little images on there and each one you want a drop shadow or maybe you want to give it a bevel and emboss or some kind of layer style. Instead of having to redo it on every single one, you can just right click, copy, and then just paste, 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 paste. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's take a look at a vignette. What is vignetting? Is it a type of salad dressing? Raspberry vignette? I think it's red. Oh, sorry. <laughs> What is vignetting? Darkening around the edges. Around the edges, yeah. Some lenses are prone to what they call vignetting, a little bit of darkening around the edges of the frame. Your eyes tend naturally to get drawn to the brightest part of an image. So if you do a little bit of darkening around the outside, it kind of helps focus your attention in, hopefully towards the focus of the image. If I wanted to do some vignetting around this, maybe I want a little bit more darkness around here. Maybe I want it to come around the edge here. Maybe a little bit more on this side, less over there. Let's take a look at a way we could add some vignetting to this in a non-destructive way, in an editable way, and I'll show you a couple of ways we could do it. I'm going to make a new adjustment layer, and I'm going to do it down at the bottom of the stack here. Whenever you make a new layer or you paste something into a document, 
uh, the new layer is going to appear directly above the currently selected layer. So by selecting this layer here, it's only the background I want to vignette. And I'm going to throw on, let's do a levels adjustment layer. And then I'll just grab that middle slider and I'll pull it to the right. OK, I've darkened the edges. I've darkened everything else too. What could I do to limit that darkening effect only to the edges of the image? What is this thing here? It's a layer mask. So right now it's white, it's revealing that darkening effect. If I did want to do that very traditional vignetting, just kind of lightening up the center there, or just kind of darkening around the edges, I could take a VHSB, big honking soft brush, and I could just paint some black down the center. Whoops. And there's just the outside edges vignetted in. But if I want a little more control, I could invert this layer mask. Command I fills it with black. And then with some white paint in the same BHSB, do a little darkening wherever I want it to be. Like it could be that you've got an image where there's a person over here and you want them to stand out a little bit more. You want that bright spot on them. You could do some darkening, you know, kind of offset to one side. Maybe follow it around something in the background that you want to kind of fade into the background. Maybe you want to enhance what they're holding. You can lighten that area up. Uh, it gives you a lot of control over where that lightening and darkening is applied. And a side benefit of that, because it's an adjustment layer, it's infinitely adjustable. If the client called up and said, ah, it's great, but I think that uh, darkening around the outside is a little bit strong, I'd be like, okay, well, no problem, no problem. I'll just uh, open up this adjustment layer here. Notice the slider is right where I left it. I can ease that effect off. Or I could intensify it a bit more. Or I could use it to lighten. Infinitely changeable. And it doesn't do any further damage. I can play around this all I want. It won't do any more damage to the background because if I turn this eyeball off, you can see that I haven't actually done anything to the background anyway. So this is nice because I can make changes to it like this. I can go, oh, let's make it a little bit darker. Let's make it a little bit lighter. But it can only go one direction. I can darken or I can lighten, but I can't do both. Another way of achieving that same sort of effect, I'm just going to throw this in here out. New transparent layer. Pop it into soft light or even overlay blending mode. I'll do soft light for now. And because of that blending mode, if I take a paintbrush, and I paint with white, I can lighten up the pixels below. If I paint with black, I can darken down the pixels below. Now, I did that at 100% opacity. That's a little bit intense there. But if I drop the opacity a bit, maybe 50% or so, I can do a little bit of vignetting around the outside. Same basic idea. But then if I also wanted to help pull the attention towards the center, maybe do a little bit of lightning in there, I can hit X on the keyboard. I've switched around to white. And now I'm lightening. So same basic idea. I can darken, but I can also lighten. I don't have that same amount of versatility. If the client says, ah, it's great, but can you make it a little bit darker around the outside? Well, with this layer, I can only make it so dark. If I put it at 100% and I paint some black back there, if I go over it again, it's not going to get any darker. It's only doing whatever black does. I could duplicate this layer, and that would double the effect. But you don't have the same degree of control as when you're using an adjustment layer. It could be that you want to grab elements from other areas. Uh, go back into the folder, the Layers folder, and you'll see something that will look familiar. Layermask.psd. Double click that. That should launch up in Photoshop. Remember this flower? Yeah, and you're thinking, oh man, do you know how long that took to cut that out? Is he going to make us do that again? No, I'm not. Take a look in the Layers panel. What do you see right beside the layer? A big red X attached to a layer mask. What do you think that red X is? It's disabled. Give this a try. Hold down your shift key and click on that layer mask, on that red X. Ah, so layer masks, wonderful things, totally non-destructive. They hide pixels. But if you want to see what was originally on that layer, if you hold down the shift key, you can temporarily disable that layer mask. Just like if you hold down the option key and click on the layer mask, you can make it visible. Basically, it's just white revealing the flower, black hiding the background. Option click to make it visible. If you command click, that actually loads it up as a selection. We don't need that. But we want to get this flower over to that yellow circle. The client wants that flower on the yellow circle. I don't, this is a weird client. How could we get this over to that other document? We could copy it and paste it. Edit, copy. The thing about copying, what does it do? Like when you copy, where does that information go? Your clipboard, which is your computer's RAM. And Photoshop has a much larger clipboard than the rest of your computer. If you're in Word and you select, you know, the edit, copy, that's barely anything. But in Photoshop, you could have like a, you know, 100 megabyte document open, uh, you know, 16 bits, so it's like 200 megabytes. And you could select all 
copy those pixels and paste them somewhere else. That's like 100 megabytes of information just popped up into your computer's memory, basically sucking up RAM. Here's a way to send it over there without using up RAM. If you right click on the name layer zero, there's that duplicate layer option. And it's asking for a little bit of information. It says, what do you want to call it? You don't have to rename it anything. I'm going to call it flower because, you know, I like to be creative. And the destination says, well, where do you want this to go? Well, we were working on that document, lock and link. So I'll select that. And when I hit OK, it is telling me that the document that I'm sending over, it's an sRGB right now. The document that I'm sending it into is an Adobe RGB. What do I want to do about that? Don't worry about it. Just say, it's just letting me know that it's going to have to do a little bit of color conversion. Hit OK, and let's pop over to lock and link. And oh, hmm. See if you can get that flower right on top of that yellow circle. Remember I said when you add something to a document or make a new transparent layer, it appears directly above the currently selected layer? Well, the last layer I was working on was layer four, so it appeared directly above that. Yeah, it's just a matter of changing the stacking order. And then with the Move tool, we can drag it over. This is a very useful image we're creating. <laughs> it's more about the techniques than the, uh, than the final result. Uh, now, the client also wants this flower, a duplicate of it, put onto this blue circle, but it's going to overhang the circle. They don't want it to overhang. They only want it to be visible where the circle is visible. Let's give that a try. Let's make a duplicate of the flower. There's a couple ways we could. We could right click and choose duplicate layer, and this time, we just need to hit OK. The destination automatically goes to itself. We can hit OK, and it makes a copy of that flower. Another way of making a duplicate of a layer, a faster way, Command J. It used to be the Apple key, so it was Apple J. So I always remember Apple Jacks to think of it, but it just sounds stupid now because it's Command. So Command J makes a duplicate of it. Grab the Move tool, and we can put that flower. Oh, except they only want it to be visible, not shrunk down to fit within, but only visible where that blue circle is visible. How do you think we could do that? Well, first off, I'm going to drag it down in the stacking order so it's directly above that blue layer. You guys remember clipping groups? Try clipping it to that blue circle. Use a clipping mask to clip this flower copy to that blue circle. And look at what happens. It looks like the ends of the flower have been cut off. They're still there. You just can't see them because on the layer below, the layer that it is clipped to, there's no pixels. It's transparent around there. So the layer above, because it's clipped, also becomes transparent. If you move it around, you can basically see what's happening there. It's only visible where the pixels below are visible. And again, if you let's say you were creating a, a little promo piece. Let's say you've made a little promo piece, and you want to have photos on each of these little rectangles here. Well, instead of, let's say you, know, you want the curved edge, you know, a rounded rectangle, you got the uh, bevel and emboss on there. If I make a gray square, this little gray rectangle here, there's a rounded rectangle, and it has the bevel and emboss, or if I wanted it, it could have a drop shadow. Again, because of these eyeballs here, I can have whichever one I want. And then I take this photo here, and I line it up over top of it. Instead of having to add the bevel to this photo, having to round the corners and stuff, if I simply clip it to this rectangle below, there's the clip, it's only visible, and the bevel and emboss makes its way right through to the layer above. So if you have three little uh, side jobs, you got to do weddings, you do portraiture, and you do babies. This could be your weddings one. You throw the photos over top of these little gray rectangles, clip it to the rectangle, and whatever effects have been applied, apply also to the image, and it conforms to the shape. And it doesn't have to be a rectangle. It could be a circle. It could be uh, you know, that film strip with the little holes in it, whatever you've got. OK, I think that's about it for that image.